Hello and welcome to some more Star Citizen. We've had the Star Citizen narrative team and devs talking about various elements of the game in a community questions post. Let me summarise some of the highlights and important parts of that and we'll put them in a bit more context if appropriate. Will there be a new Tavarin ship manufacturer? Currently there are not any plans for new Tavarin ships, but if ever needed there are two obvious candidates apparently. The first option would be a bold new aerospace startup based on Jalan in the Elysium system, formerly the Tavarans' homeworld of Kalith. They might want to make a non-combat ship to sort of like lean on a Tavaran cultural resurgence is the sort of idea behind that, so um, maybe you'll see a non-combat ship for the Tavaran in the future. Uh, their ships probably wouldn't be replicas, but instead blend Tavaran design and aesthetic with some human flourishes. Another option would be the emergence of a new ship manufacturer in the Brana system, which is currently home to the largest concentration of Tavaran people, these ships would have originally been built for practical purposes and primarily used by the Tavaran within the system, thus a focus on producing non-combat craft. Compared to major UE manufacturers, they would probably be a bit low-tech and maybe use more modular designs, like a modern Tavaran take on the Drake aesthetic, justifying why and how these ships have made their way into the wider UEE definitely would take a little more narrative shoe leather but could be done again these ships wouldn't be straight up replicas but modern ships designed for tavarans that also incorporate elements from their past in interesting new ways also if there's ever a desire to create an old school tavaran hauler or other non-combat ship there's always Speria and their access to the Tavaran ships abandoned in the Cowboy system. It makes sense that some of the ships that they would have found there would um, have been geared towards practical non-combat needs of the Tavaran people. I like the idea of ever-expanding uh, ships in Star Citizen. Obviously, I do want them to build out a game. I do want them to build out gameplay loops, uh, but also they do want a huge range of ships which they can build over the next five, ten years uh, or so, um, even well beyond the game's release. What happened to the old Osprey and Devastator Anvil ships mentioned in lore? Uh, were they renamed? Uh, when world building, we often include names of ships, items, people, places, and other things that aren't an immediate focus for the lore or game. This flavor text enriches the world by creating a sense of history and mystery, plus having a few names like this sitting around helps us when the ship team presents a new craft in need of a name. Uh, in fact, that's exactly how the Hurricane got its name. While the Hornet and Gladiator were part of Anvil's original ship lineup, the Hurricane was not. When the ship team brought us the idea for an Anvil heavy fighter featuring six powerful ballistic guns, the Hurricane name fit perfectly. The Osprey has already shown up in lore as part of a fleet of security ships in an episode of Lost Squad, a Spectrum show focused on the fateful days before the fall of Caliban to the Vandal in 2884. So quite some distance in the past in the Star Citizen universe. The call out is intentionally leaning on specifics, but the ship is being used by a security force and engaging hostiles, so there's a strong chance it's a fighter. However, the Devastator has not been mentioned outside of the Anvil portfolio. With all that said, they're avoid getting into anything more specific, so the Osprey and Devastator names could be used if the right Anvil ship design presents itself in the future. What is the process for designing a new star system and its aesthetics? Is the Vega star in Star Citizen the same as the one we have in real life? So the answer to that is no. The star at the center of the Vega system is not Vega, not the star that we see from Earth in real life, which explains the differences in its size and that sort of stuff. That We are not seeing a real star system sort of remade in Star Citizen in its, its own sort of universe, its own sort of pocket dimension. The same goes for any other system in-game that shares a name with a star in our sky. None are meant to represent the star that we are familiar with. And they go on to say, creating a star system is an extremely collaborative endeavor between narrative, art, and design. On the narrative side, they first brainstorm details for each system, and then previously they've worked with astronomers, so get the science behind each one and make sure it makes sense. Sometimes they bend the science a bit to make something work for the game, and sometimes they changed the original idea to match the science, and this process has led to a massive spreadsheet that includes a tab dedicated to stars in game that tracks details like um, stellar classification, solar mass, surface temperature, and much, much more. That way, the art and design, when they begin to do their thing, can have details delivered to them that um, they may not know, or they may have a really good use to. They go, well, actually, um, these are the habitable planets there, these are the green band, um, this is the temperature of the moons, this is how the wind blows around the planet, this is how it would affect the tides on the seas, this is how old it is, all that sort of jazz. Uh, simply put, 
Part of Narrative's job is to provide a scientific foundation for these and then collaborate with art and design, while these details provide a good starting point for other teams and are based on current scientific thinking. There still may be adjustments due to art or gameplay requirements. This is still a game, so at the end of the day, what looks and plays best might not always be hard science. And to be honest, that's something I'm actually very glad for. I want to play Star Citizen and enjoy Star Citizen. I don't want it to be a physically accurate um, perfectly um, sort of like sim game. I, I want to have fun. I want to mess around. Uh, I want to, to have gamifiedness because I am a being sitting in front of a computer wanting to play a game. That said, if people want um, super sim and that sort of stuff, I'm willing to hear your thoughts in the comments below and that sort of stuff. I can only very much talk about what I want for the game from my point of view uh, and then just for the rest of the time represent the news and talk about what other people want. Uh, what's the most dangerous UEE system in terms of overall crime levels and risk of piracy? The answer here from the narrative guys is since player actions will ultimately factor into how dangerous the system will be, we haven't planted a flag and said with certainty that this one system will have the most criminal activity. That said, a simple hauler who prefers stunning vistas to combat operations, um, here's a few systems I'll be avoiding unless absolutely necessary. Uh, Nexus which is called the Crossroads of Grime for a reason. Currently, it has four jump points and three of them lead into unclaimed systems that outlaws can easily escape into. Some of the most infamous criminal actions of the past few decades, um, Keller's Run and the Walza Massacre, uh, occurred in Nexus. Criminality became so rampant that the UEE launched a major operation to reclaim Nexus 3 in 2934, an event that inspired the appropriately named Theatres of War map, Crossroads of Crime. Even though the UE military now controls Nexus 3, Largo, Nexus 4, remains so dangerous that most cities and outposts are heavily fortified. To get a feel for what that means for its residents, check out the short story Sid and Cirrus, and about an aging couple forced to venture into the untamed planet side in search of their daughter. Following Nexus, um, Sharon might seem like an obvious choice, but a brutal civil war has been raging on Sharon 3 since 2944. That means its local governments are unstable and more concerned with their survival than safety in the system. Uniquely, Sharon is the only UE system to revoke their representation in the UE Senate in protest over horrors committed there during the Mesa regime. This means the advocacy and other UE forces are probably less likely to come to your defense here than anywhere else in the Empire. So not in the whole of the Star Citizen universe, just anywhere else that is um, a UE system. Next, Magnus. Ferron and Fora all have a long history of outlaw activity due to a variety of factors, including ineffectual local government and law enforcement forces. Kruger Intergalactic left Magnus for Castra in 2789 after a key shipment of parts was hijacked by outlaws, threatening their extremely lucrative and important contract with RSI. Meanwhile, in Fora, a terraforming mishap on Hyperion 403, uh, the only potential habitable planet, left this system on the edge of Banu space, largely ignored by the rest of the Empire. The Star map even claims informal consensus of the area indicate that visitors are more likely to encounter a smuggler, outlaw or Banu settler than a UEE citizen while in this five planet system. Finally, Ferron was once a thriving system until manufacturers fled due to political pressure from the Massa regime and the system's easily accessible resources being mostly depleted. Things have gone so bad that the police force in Tram, um, Azura of Ferron 3, went on strike in the past in protest of the overwhelming dangers they face on the job. Lastly, for completion's sake, uh, two of the UE's most dangerous systems that are that way due to natural phenomena are the Banshee system, and um, it has the sort of pulsar in the centre of it spewing so much radiation that too much exposure is a death sentence, uh, leading to the system's only habitable areas being underground. Finally, the recently discovered TAMSA system is still technically off limits to people while the UE surveys and studies the black hole found in that area. So, you want black holes in your game? You may have them. What's to keep people from using the sort of Star Citizen regen um, methods, um, because you're supposed to sort of be able to teleport to your body effectively, um, as a method of FTL communication? That was an interesting question asked, and the answer is, uh, since faster than light FTL communication doesn't exist in the Star Citizen universe, it's easy to see why dying and immediately regenerating somewhere else seems like a tempting data running option. That said, we've done our best to make it an ineffective one. When doing a mission, data would probably have to be stored on a physical device, which would either remain on the deceased body or the server aboard their now abandoned ship. Needing a physical device or ship server to store and transfer the data should negate 
regen is a viable option. Also, when you regen, it sort of messes up your, your um, image, your imprint, your, your DNA, and brings you one step closer to a true death. And also, you know, it's a bit funky for your body. You, d you don't want that. That's not great. What can you tell us about the Terran cities of New Austin and Quasi? Apologies if I get any of the um, sort of pronunciation of this stuff wrong. Both cities are located on Terra 3, uh, an oxygen-rich super-Earth that was naturally habitable for humans. Quasi is the planet's second largest city after Prime and located in the southern hemisphere in the shadow of the Nesse Mountains. Summers there are relatively cool and it gets more than 200 millimeters of snow per season. The city is a tourist destination in part due to the large and mysterious ancient ruins located nearby. Inspira founders, the Ingstrom brothers, grew up in Quasi and became fascinated with the ruins. Meanwhile, New Austin is a smaller and more industrial city, though there's been a concerted effort to integrate factories into the natural environment instead of destroying it. Compared to Prime and Quasi, the New Austin has more of a blue collar vibe with the city center most famous landmarks being the Old Hall that where members of the United Resource Workers would meet. Generally less expensive than Terra's other major cities, New Austin has become an increasingly popular spot for people and companies to move in. The Satabal Territorial League has their headquarters there. Origin Jumpworks moved their um, sort of headquarters um, to New Austin in 2913, which may have sparked a hack on the release of the details of their Goldfinch ship prototype. Despite being smaller and less of a tourist destination than Prime and Quasi, New Austin still boasts impressive infrastructure and enough prestige to ho have hosted CitizenCon in 2948. There's a lot of lore there for you, however, um, I think that it's quite important to know how we're going to see the Terra system in game. So it's going to be these super earth planets. It's going to be these really built up city planets that are going to be quite pretty, but alien in the fact that they're very futuristic and how has human architecture sort of evolved in a major heart of the empire kind of way. It's, it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, do the Nine Tails and Gangs of Pyro have a color and armor scheme? Yes. You'll be seeing these visual distinctions between gangs in Pyro. The looks of each gang is definitely taken into consideration during the development and is something we hope to keep improving on for current outlaws in game. A gang's colors or other distinct visual traits are part of the kickoff process with the character team. We also consider what type of armor they would wear and how it could distinguish them between different ranks in their gang. Then there's the question of if the gang has a symbol, identifying tattoos, or even like the insane pyro gang, the fire rats, if members have severe burns or scars from uh, initiation rites. A lot of these visual details are being worked out together with the character team. We provide them with the palette and then let them work their magic on the specifics. Yet, it does not stop there. On the narrative side, when creating these gangs, we also consider factors like the area of influence, organization structure, approximate wealth, allies, rivals, and more. Answering such questions often leads us to ways to better visually represent them. For example, a wealthy gang with a strict hierarchy and penchant for combat might have good gear and clear visual distinctions between ranks. Meanwhile, a shipjacking gang focused on survival um, more than riches might not have a cohesive look and instead mix and match whatever armor and equipment they find after a successful mission. There might even be a gang or two who avoid identifying colors and marks so they can remain mysterious and harder to track down. Simply, our goal is a diversity of looks for gangs and it's a very collaborative process between narrative and characters. Boom! That's it for your dose of Star Citizen narrative answers uh, today. I'll link the full post down below because there were a couple more questions that I felt were less important about how does the air smell at uh, Orison or what entertainment options are there in 2950 which didn't really answer all the stuff for us to do in game. It just sort of went, these are the sort of movies they watch. They watch old movies and they're studying. They're studying the humans of the past. But anyway, what do you think? Do you like these kind of posts where the narrative guys answer some questions? Uh, would you like to see a Devastator or Osprey Anvil ship? Are you looking forward to seeing the Terra system in game one day? Whatever your thoughts, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. I am French and sophisticated. I am also French and also sophisticated. Let us go on a date. Neither of these people are French or sophisticated. It was me doing a funny voice as well as showing the horrors of dating online and what happens if you accidentally catfish yourself with two of your own accounts. But French people don't talk like that even. No one does. 
NordVPN can make you appear to be in France, but it doesn't make you French, as I've now found out. It can be used to improve security or give you more accessibility to the internet. I can watch all my favourite shows. Get yourself NordVPN today in the links below and maybe be a better version of yourself. Now that's shilling for you. Every month we have a Star Citizen ship giveaway, and March is no different. We have a Crusader Industries Mercury Star Runner. This multi-crew, multi-roll, cargo and data running ship is my favourite ship in the game. It has loads of smuggling holes, it's got a good amount of armament, it can do a little bit of everything in the game at the moment. To be in for a chance of winning it, just comment on any of my videos made during March. More details in the description below. Please consider liking, subscribing, and potentially even clicking that join button under my videos to help further support the channel. Share the videos around with your friends and family. You'll occasionally get exclusive videos, posts, and polls that help influence the channel along with emotes and badges to show your support. It really does help. There's also a Patreon and direct donations tool for those inclined. Thanks for watching, and I hope that you have a great March 2022.